Chapter 4 The March to Mexico One morning we started on our march to the city of Cholula, and that day we went on to sleep at a river which runs within a short league of the city, and there they put up for us some huts and ranchos. This same night the caciques of Cholula sent some chieftains to bid us welcome to their country, and they brought supplies of poultry and maize bread, and said in the morning all the caciques and priests would come out to receive us, and they asked us to forgive their not having come sooner. Cortez thanked them both for the food they had brought and for the good will which they showed us. At dawn we began to march, and the caciques and priests and many other Indians came out to receive us. Most of them were clothed in cotton garments made like tunics. They came in a most peaceful manner and willingly, and the priests carried braziers containing incense with which they fumigated our captain and us soldiers who were standing near him. When these priests and chiefs saw the Tlaxcalan Indians who came with us, they asked Doña Marina to tell the general that it was not right that their enemies with arms in their hands should enter their city in that manner. When our captain understood this, he ordered the soldiers and the baggage to halt, and when he saw us all together and that no one was moving, he said, It seems to me, sirs, that before we enter Cholula, these caciques and priests should be put to the proof with a friendly speech, so that we can see what their wishes may be. For they come complaining of our friends the Tlashkalans, and they have much cause for what they say, and I want to make them understand in fair words the reason why we come to their city. And as you gentlemen already know, the Tlashkalans have told us that the Cholulans are a turbulent people, and as it would be a good thing that by fair means they should render their obedience to his majesty, this appears to me to be the proper thing to do. Then he told Doña Marina to call up the caciques and priests to where he was stationed on horseback, with all of us around him. And the three chieftains and two priests came at once, and they said, Malinche, forgive us for not coming to Tlaxcala to see you and to bring food. It was not for want of goodwill, but because Maciascazi and Chicotenga and all Tlaxcala are our enemies, and have said many evil things of us, and of the great Montezuma our prince. And as though what they said were not enough, they now have the boldness, under your protection, to come armed into our city, and we beg you as a favor to order them to return to their own country, or at least to stay outside in the fields, and not to enter our city in such a manner. But as for us, they said that we were very welcome. As our captain saw that what they said was reasonable, he had once sent Pedro de Alvarado and Cristobal de Olid to ask the Tlaxcalans to put up their huts and ranchos there in the fields, and not to enter the city with us, excepting those who were carrying the cannon, and our friends from Sempoala, and he told them to explain to the Tlaxcalans that the reason why he asked them to do so was that all the caciques and priests were afraid of them, and that when we left Cholula on our way to Mexico, we would send to summon them, and that they were not to be annoyed at what he was doing. When the people of Cholula knew what Cortez had done, they appeared to be much more at ease. Then Cortez began to make a speech to them, saying that our lord the king had sent us to these countries to give them warning, and command them not to worship idols, nor sacrifice human beings, or eat their flesh. And as the road to Mexico, whither we were going to speak with the great Montezuma, passed by there, and there was no other shorter road, we had come to visit their city and to treat them as brothers. As other great caciques had given their obedience to his majesty, it would be well that they should give theirs as the others had done. They replied that we were hardly entered into their country, yet we already ordered them to give up their duels, and that they could not do it. As to giving their obedience to our king, they were content to do so, and thus they pledged their word, but it was not done before notary. When this was over, we at once began our march towards the city, and so great was the number of people who came out to see us that both the streets and housetops were crowded. And I do not wonder at this, for they had never seen such men as we are, nor had they ever seen horses. They lodged us in some large rooms where we were all together with our friends from Zempoala and the Tlaxcalans who carried the baggage, and they fed us on that day and the next very well and abundantly. After the people of Cholula had received us in the festive manner already described, and most certainly with a show of goodwill, it pre presently appeared that Montezuma sent orders to his ambassadors, who were still in our company, to negotiate with the Cholulans that an army of twenty thousand men 
which Montezuma had sent and equipped, should, on entering the city, join with them in attacking us by night or by day, get us into a hopeless plight, and bring all of us they could capture bound to Mexico, and he sent many jewels and presents and cloths, also a golden drum, and he also sent word to the priests of the city that they were to retain twenty of us to sacrifice to their idols. The warriors who Montezuma sent were stationed in some ranchos and some rocky thickets about half a league from Cholula, and some were already posted within the houses. They fed us very well for the first two days, but on the third day they neither gave us anything to eat, nor did any of the caciques or priests make their appearance, and if any Indians came to look at us, they did not approach us, but remained some distance off, laughing at us as though mocking us. When our captain saw this, he told our interpreters to tell the ambassadors of the great Montezuma to order the caciques to bring some food. But all they brought us was water and firewood, and the old men who brought it said there was no more maize. That same day other ambassadors arrived from Montezuma and joined those who were already with us, and they said to Cortez, very impudently, that their prince had sent them to say that we were not to go by his city, because he had nothing to give us to eat, and that they wished at once to return to Mexico with our reply. When Cortez saw that their speech was unfriendly, he replied to the ambassadors in the blandest manner, that he marveled how such a great prince as Montezuma should be so vacillating, and he begged them not to return to Mexico, for he wished to start himself on the next day to see their prince, and act according to his orders. And I believe that he gave the ambassadors some strings of beads, and they agreed to stay. When this had been done, our captain called us together and said to us, I see that these people are very much disturbed, and it behooves us to keep them on the alert, in case some trouble is brewing among them. And he at once sent for the principal cacique, telling him either to come himself or to send some of the chieftains. The cacique replied that he was ill, and could not come. When our captain heard this, he ordered us to bring before him, with kindly persuasion, two of the numerous priests who were in the great queue near our quarters. We brought two of them without doing them any disrespect, and Cortez ordered each of them to be given a chalchuite, and addressing them with friendly words, he asked them what was the reason that the Xeek and chieftains and most of the priests were frightened, for he had sent to summon them, and they did not want to come. It seems that one of these priests was a very important personage among them, who had charge of or command over all the queues in the city, and was a sort of bishop among the priests, and was held in great respect. He replied that they who were priests had no fear of us, and if the cacique and chieftain did not wish to come, he would go himself and summon them, and that if he spoke to them he believed that they would do as he told them, and would come. Cortez at once told him to go, and that his companion should await his return. So the priest departed and summoned the cacique and chieftains who returned in his company to Cortez's quarters. Cortez asked them what it was they were afraid of, and why they had not given us anything to eat, and said that if our presence in their city were an annoyance to them, we wished to leave the next day from Hago to see and speak to Lord Montezuma. And he asked them to provide carriers for the transport to the baggage and the tapusques, and to send us some food at once. The cacique was so embarrassed that he could hardly speak, he said they would look for food, but their lord Montezuma had sent to tell them not to give us any, and was not willing that we should proceed any further. While this conversation was taking place, three of our friends, the Sempoal Indians, came in and said secretly to Cortez that close by where we were quartered they had found holes dug in the streets, covered over with wood and earth, so that without careful examination one could not see them, that they had removed the earth from above one of the holes and found it full of sharp pointed stakes to kill the horses when they galloped, and that the azoteas had breastworks of adobes and were piled up with stones, and certainly this was not done with good intent, for they also found barricades of thick timbers in another street. At this moment eight Tlaxcalans arrived, from the Indians whom we had left outside in the fields, with orders that they were not to enter Cholula, and they said to Cortez, Take heed, Malinche, for this city is ill-disposed, and we know that this night they have sacrificed to their idol, which is the god of war, seven persons, five of them children, so the god may give them victory over you, and we have further seen that they are moving all their baggage and women and children out of the city. When Cortez heard this, he immediately sent these Tlaxcalans back to their captains, with orders to be fully prepared if we should send to summon them, 
and he turned to speak to the caciques, priests, and chieftains of Cholula, and told them to have no fear and show no alarm, but to remember the obedience which they had promised to him, and not to swerve from it lest he should have to chastise them. That he had already told them that we wished to set out on the morrow, and that he had need of two thousand warriors from the city to accompany us, just as the Tlash Collins had provided them, for they were necessary on the road. They replied that the men would be given, and asked leave to go at once to get them ready, and they then went away very well contented, for they thought between the warriors with whom they were to supply us, and the regiments sent by Montezuma, which were hidden in the rocky thickets and barrancas, we could not escape death or capture, for the horses would not be able to charge on account of certain breastworks and barricades, which they immediately advised the troops to construct that only a narrow lane would be left through which it would be impossible for us to pass. They warned the Mexicans to be in readiness as we intended to start on the next day, and told them that our capture would be sure, for they had made sacrifices to their war idols who had promised them victory. As our captain wished to be more thoroughly informed about the plot and all that was happening, he told Doña Marina to take more chachuites to the two priests who had been the first to speak, for well, they were not afraid and to tell them with friendly words that Malinche wished them to come back and speak to him, and to bring them back with her. Doña Marina went and spoke to the priests in the manner she knew so well how to use, and thanks to the presence they at once accompanied her. Cortez addressed them and asked them to say truly what they knew, for they were priests of idols and chieftains, and ought not to lie, and that what they should say would not be disclosed in any manner, for we were going to leave the next morning and he would give them a large quantity of cloth. They said the truth was that their lord Montezuma knew that we were coming to their city, and that every day he was of many minds and could not come to any decision on the matter, that sometimes he sent orders to pay us much respect when we arrived, and to guide us on the way to his city, and at other times he would send word that it was not his wish that we should go to Mexico, and now recently his gods Tezcatopeca, and Huichilobos, to whom he paid great devotion, had counseled him that we should either be killed here in Cholula, or should be sent bound to Mexico. That the day before he had sent out twenty thousand warriors, and half of them were already within this city, and the other half were stationed nearby in some gullies, and that they already knew that we were about to start tomorrow. They also told us about the barricades which they had ordered to be made, and the two thousand warriors that were to be given to us, and how it had already been agreed that twenty of us were to be kept to be sacrificed to the idols of Cholula. Cortez ordered these men to be given a present of richly embroidered cloth, and told them not to say anything about the information they had given us, for if they disclosed it on a return from Mexico, we would kill them. He also told them that we should start early the next morning, and he asked them to summon all the caciques to come then so that he might speak to them. That night Cortez took counsel of us, as to what should be done, for he had very able men with him whose advice was worth having. But as in such cases frequently happens, some said that it would be advisable to change our course and go by Huichotzingo, others that we must manage to preserve the peace by every possible means, and that it would be better to return to Tlaxcala. Others of us gave our opinion that if we allowed such treachery to pass unpunished, wherever we went we should be treated to worse treachery, and that being there in the town with ample provisions, we ought to make an attack, for the Indians would feel the effect of it more in their own homes than they would in the open, and that we should at once warn the Tlaxcalans so that they might join in it. All thought well of this last advice, as Cortez had already told them that we were going to set out on the following day. For this reason, we should make a show of trying together our baggage, which was little enough, and then in the large courts with high walls where we were lodged, we should fall on the Indian warriors who well deserved their fate. As regards the ambassadors of Montezuma, we should dissemble and tell them that the evil-minded Cholulans had intended treachery and had attempted to put the blame for it on their lord Montezuma and on themselves as his ambassadors. But we did not believe Montezuma had given any such orders, and we begged them to stay in their apartments and not have any further converse with the people of the city that we should not have reason to think they were in league with them in the treachery, and we asked them to go with us as our guides to Mexico. They replied that neither they themselves nor their lord Montezuma knew anything about that which we were telling them, although they did not like it, 
We placed guards over the ambassadors so that they could not go out without our permission. All that night, we were on the alert and under arms with the horses saddled and bridled, for we thought that for certain all the companies of the Magans as well as the Cholulans would attack us during the night. There was an old Indian woman, the wife of a cacique, who knew all about the plot and trap which had been arranged, and she had come secretly to Doña Marina, having noticed that she was young and good-looking and rich, and advised her, if she wanted to escape with her life, to come with her to her house, for it was certain that on that night or during the next day we were all going to be killed. Because she knew of this, and on account of the compassion she felt for Doña Marina, she had come to tell her that she had better get all her possessions together and come with her to her house, and she would there marry her to her son, the brother of a youth who accompanied her. When Doña Marina understood this, and she was always very shrewd, she said to her, Oh, mother, thank you much for this that you have told me. I would go with you at once, but that I have no one here whom I can trust to carry my clothes and jewels of gold, of which I have many. For goodness sake, mother, wait here for a little while, you and your son, and tonight we will set out, for now, as you can see, these tables are on the watch and will hear us. The old woman believed what she said, and remained chatting with her, and Doña Marina asked her how they were going to kill us all, and how and when and where the plot was made. The old woman told her neither more nor less than what the two priests had already stated, and Doña Marina replied, If this affair is such a secret, how is it that you came to know about it? And the old woman replied that her husband had told her, for he was a captain of one of the parties in the city. As to the plot, she had known about it for three days, for a gilded drum had been sent to her husband from Mexico, and rich cloaks and jewels of gold had been sent to three other captains to induce them to bring us bound to their lord Montezuma. When Doña Marina heard this, she deceived the old woman and said, How delighted I am to hear that your son, to whom you wish to marry me, is a man of distinction. We have already talked a good deal, and I do not want him to, to notice us. So, mother... You wait here while I begin to bring my property, for I cannot bring it all at once, and you and your son, my brother, will take care of it, and then we shall be able to go. The old woman believed all that was told her, and she and her son sat down to rest. Then Doña Marina went swiftly to the captain, and told him all that had passed with the Indian woman. Cortez at once ordered her to be brought before him, and questioned her about these treasons and plots, and she told him neither more nor less than the priest had already said so he placed a guard over the woman that she could not escape. When dawn broke, it was a sight to see the haste with which the caciques and priests brought in the warriors, laughing and contented as though they had already caught us in their traps and nets, and they brought more Indian warriors than we had asked for, and large as they are, for they still stand as a memorial of the past, the courtyards would not hold them all. We were already quite prepared for what had to be done. The soldiers with swords and shields were stationed at the gate of the great court, so as not to let a single armed Indian pass out. Our captain was mounted on horseback, with many soldiers around him as a guard, and when we saw how very early the caciques and priests and warriors had arrived, he said, How oh, these traitors long to see us among the barrancas so as to gorge on our flesh. But our lord will do better for us. Then he asked for the two priests who had let out the secret, and he sent our interpreter Aguilar to tell them to go to their houses, for he had no need of their presence now. This was in order that as they should have done us a good turn, they should not suffer for it, and should not get killed. Cortez was on horseback, and Doña Marina near to him, and he asked the caciques why was it, as we had done them no harm whatever, they wished to kill us. And why should they turn traitors against us when all we had said or done was to warn them against certain things of which we had already warned all the towns that we had passed through, and to tell them about matters concerning our holy faith, and this without compulsion of any kind? To what purpose, then, had they quite recently prepared many long and strong poles with collars and cords and placed them in a house near to the great temple? And why, for the last three days, have they been building barricades and digging holes in the streets and raising breastworks on the roofs of the houses? And why had they removed their children and wives and property from the city? Their ill will, however, had been plainly shown, and they had not been able to hide their treason. 
They had not even given us food to eat, and as a mockery they had brought us firewood and water, and said that there was no maize. He knew well that on the Barrancas nearby there were many companies of warriors lying in wait for us, ready to carry out their treacherous plans, thinking that we should pass along that road towards Mexico. So in return for our having come to treat them like brothers, and to tell them what our Lord God and the King had ordained, they wished to kill us and eat our flesh, and had already prepared the pots with salt and peppers and tomatoes. If this was what they wanted, it would have been better for them to make war on us in the open field, like good and valiant warriors, as did their neighbors the Tlashkalans. He knew for certain all that had been planned in the city, and that they had even promised their idol that twenty of us should be sacrificed before it, and that three nights ago they had sacrificed seven Indians to it to ensure victory, which was promised them, but as the idol was both evil and false, it neither had nor would have power against us, and all these evil and traitorous designs which they had planned and put into effect were about to recoil on themselves. Doña Marina told all this to them, and made them understand it very clearly, and when the priests, caciques, and captains had heard it, they said that what had been stated was true, but that they were not to blame for it, for the ambassadors of Montezuma had ordered it at the command of their prince. Then Cortes told them that the royal laws decreed that such treasons as these should not remain unpunished, and that for their crime they must die. Then he ordered a musket to be fired, which was the signal that we had agreed upon for that purpose, and a blow was given to them which they will remember forever, for we killed many of them, so they gained nothing from their promises of their false idols. Not two hours had passed before our allies, the Tlashkalans, arrived, and they had brought very fiercely where the Cholulans had posted other companies to defend the streets and prevent their being entered, but these were soon defeated. The Tlashkalans went about the city plundering and making prisoners, and we could not stop them, and the next day more companies from the Tlashkalan towns arrived, and did greater damage, for they were very hostile to the people of Cholula. And when we saw this, both Cortez and the captains and the soldiers, on account of the compassion that we had felt, restrained the Tlashkalans from doing further damage. And Cortez ordered Cristobal de Olid to bring him all the Tlashkalan captains together so they could speak to them. And they did not delay in coming. Then he ordered them to gather together all their men and go and camp in the fields. And this they did, and only the men from Sempoala remained with us. Just then, certain caciques and priests of Cholula, who belonged to other districts of the town, and said that they were not concerned in the treasons against us, for it is a large city and they have parties and factions among themselves, asked Cortez and all of us to pardon the provocation of the treachery that had been plotted against us, for the traitors had already paid with their lives. Then there came the two priests who were our friends and had disclosed the secret to us, and the old woman, the wife of the captain, who wanted to be mother-in-law of Doña Marina, and all prayed Cortez for pardon. When they spoke to him, Cortez made a show of great anger and ordered the ambassadors of Montezuma, who were detained in our company, to be summoned. He then said that the whole city deserved to be destroyed, but that out of respect for their lord Montezuma, whose vassals they were, he would pardon them, and that from now on they must be well behaved, and let them beware of such affairs as the last happening again, lest they should die for it. Then he ordered the chiefs of Tlashkala, who were in the fields, to be summoned, and told them to return the men and women whom they had taken prisoners, for the damage they had done was sufficient. Giving up the prisoners went against the grain with the Tlashkalans, and they said that the Cholulans had deserved far greater punishment for the many treacheries they had constantly received at their hands. Nevertheless, as Cortez ordered it, they gave back many persons, but they still remained rich both in gold and mantles, cotton cloth, salt, and slaves. Besides this, Cortez made them and the people of Cholula friends, and from what I have seen since and ascertained, that friendship has never been broken. Furthermore, Cortez ordered all the priests and caciques to bring back the people to the city, and to hold their markets and fairs, and not to have any fear, for no harm would be done to them. They replied that within five days the city would be fully peopled again, for at that time nearly all the inhabitants were in hiding. They said it was necessary that Cortez should appoint a cacique for them, for their ruler was one of those who had died in the court. So he asked them to whom the office ought to go, 
and they said to the brother of the late cacique, so Cortes at once appointed him to be governor. In addition to this, as soon as he saw the city was re-inhabited and their markets were carried on in safety, he ordered all the priests, captains, and other chieftains of that city to assemble, and explained to them very clearly all the matters concerning our holy faith, and told them that they could see how their idols had deceived them, and were evil things, not speaking the truth. He begged them to destroy the idols and break them in pieces, that if they did not wish to do it themselves, we would do it for them. He also ordered them to whitewash a temple so we might set up a cross there. They immediately did what we asked them in the matter of the cross, and they said that they would remove their idols. But although they were many times ordered to do it, they delayed. Then the Padre de la Merced said to Cortes that it was going too far in the beginning to take away their idols until they should understand things better, and should see how our expedition to Mexico would turn out, and time would show us what we ought to do in the matter. That for the present, the warnings we had given them were sufficient, together with the setting up of the cross. Cholula is situated on a plain, in a locality where there were many neighboring towns, and it is a land fruitful in maize and other vegetables, and much chili pepper, and the land is full of magwe, from which they make their wine. They make very good pottery in the city of red and black and white clay with various designs, and with it supply Mexico and all the neighboring provinces. At that time there were many high towers in the city where the idols stood, especially the great queue which was higher than that of Mexico, although the Mexican queue was very lofty and magnificent. As soon as the squadron sent by the great Montezuma, which were already stationed in the ravines near Cholula, learned what had taken place, they returned faster than at a walk to Mexico, and told Montezuma how it all happened. But, fast as they went, the news had already reached him, through two chieftains who had been sent with us and who went to him post-haste. We learned on good authority that when Montezuma heard the news, he was greatly grieved and very angry and at once sacrificed some Indians to his idol, Huichilobos, whom they looked on as the god of war, so that he might tell him what was to be the result of our going to Mexico, or if he should permit us to enter the city. We even knew that he was shut in his devotions and sacrifices for two days, in company with ten of the chief priests, and the reply came from those idols, which was that they advised him to send messengers to us to disclaim all blame for the Cholulan affair, and that with demonstrations of peace we should be allowed to enter into Mexico, and that when we were inside, by depriving us of food and water or by raising some of the bridges, they would kill us. This affair and punishment at Cholula became known throughout the provinces of New Spain, and we had a great reputation for valor before, but from now on they took us for sorcerers, and said that no evil that was planned against us could be so hidden from us that it did not come to our knowledge, and on this account they showed us goodwill. I think that the curious reader must be already satiated hearing the story about Cholula, and I wish that I had finished writing about it, but I cannot avoid calling to mind the prisons of thick wooden beams which we found in the city, which were full of Indians and boys being fattened, so that they could be sacrificed and their flesh eaten. We broke open all those prisons, and Cortez ordered all the Indian prisoners that were confined within to return to their native countries, and with threats he ordered the caciques and captains and priests of the city not to imprison any more Indians in that way, and not to eat human flesh. They promised not to do so, but what use were such promises as they never kept them?' 